you still yawning, so it's a good morning, I guess. Yeah. In, in our culture, when you wake up, that's a good morning. We don't really go by the clock. Whatever you wake up, that's a good morning. Okay, I, I think we have to continue this competition, right? Good morning. Good morning. Ah, lost. Bummer. Uh, my name is Paul Pavel. Uh, Pablo, if you're Spanish, that's fine. Uh, don't confuse me with Apostle. I'm not one of those. Um, I've been a member of this church for five years ago, uh, for about six years, I think, or five years. I don't remember. It was a long time. A lot of familiar faces. I still have to get used to the lights um, because I can only see some shadows here. Uh, I preach once a year in English, so please pray for me so I don't say some stupid things. Uh, because my brain is uh, thinking in English, but my tongue getting stuck in my mouth. So it can come out really weird. Uh, I've been here for two and a half weeks this time. And uh, it takes me about two weeks to get back to speaking English. Because I don't speak English anywhere else. And I consider this a gift of tongues from Holy Spirit when I preach in English. So let's just go with that. Um, I have uh, four kids. I'm 40. Uh, this year is five years as we, our family, lived in the, uh, Ukraine. I'm married 20 years this year. Uh, I have a grandkid coming up this year. And some other things happened this year. So I'm a young grandpa-to-be, and the family is very important to me because all of a sudden I realized that I'm a grandpa, though I wasn't really uh, planning on it, or it was kind of a joke when I got married at 20. I was joking that I'll be grandpa by 40. Well, 40 came, and I'm getting there. So it's not funny anymore. Um, not that it's a bad thing, I enjoy it. Uh, see, uh, it's a blessing, right, to have kids, to have grandkids. But uh, when that all came around, it, family become more important to me because I realized when they're little, you think they're gonna be in your house forever. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. Like my son is not living in my house, he lives here and he's a member of the church. My daughter already married and she's uh, living on her own with husband and making babies there and kids for, uh, grandkids for us. Uh, I have two kids left in the house, and uh, you know, I'm 40, and like, this is empty house now, because it was, used to be f four kids and six of us, now all of a sudden, it's just two of them. Uh, I'm one of those who never had one child. We had twins from the get-go, like it was a surprise too. So uh, house was always full of kids, and all of a sudden, they're gone. And now I start thinking, did I do everything right? Did I have enough time to raise them right? Did I make any mistakes? Is there something that I need to correct? This thought process started in my head when I realized that my daughter is getting married two years ago and when my son said he's going to move back to the U.S. So I was uh, raising my kids in one style of uh, being a strict and uh, sometimes harsh father. And then I realized that it's not really working because I need to build a relationship because after they move out from my house and my authority, everything I have is the relationship with them and I have to build that relationship. So a lot of my head has changed during those years and I want to share some of those changes but I want to do it from the Bible and uh, have a biblical story to it. The thing is we all want our kids to succeed. That's just natural in our families. We want to see, him, see them uh, successful in life. We want to see him with education and uh, a good job and, uh, and so forth. And we have a picture of success for our kids somewhere in our head. Sometimes it's even those things that we couldn't accomplish. So we want our kids to accomplish them for us, so to speak. But we have a picture of success. And we try to guide and kind of push our kids towards that picture of success. But the bottom line, when we stop and think, the success for our child is not education, is not high paying job, is not a family, is not a kids in the family. The success for our child is when they trust God. Not when they believe in God, but when they daily trust God. I call that a success. When their life is built in a way that it's, everything is referenced to God they love and God they serve. That's a success. How'd you get there? What to do to raise such a kid? There, I know some very faithful parents that have very non-Christian kids. And it's a struggle for me too, because my kids are still, some of them grown, some of them still, they look grown, but they're not grown. You know how it happens, and um, some of them are 
way over, you know, like 16 go on, uh, or 13 go on 16, something like that. They're all different. But how do you, what, what you do? How do you live your life and uh, do family in the way that your kids would be like that? That's a challenge, would you say? It's my challenge and your challenge, and your challenge probably is an even bigger challenge because you're in a different culture with different values. And it's, it's not easy because you have influence of the world and schools and everything on your kids and universities and so forth with very liberal agendas, and you have a Bible on the other side that you want to teach your kids how to trust God through the Word of God. It's a challenge. And farther we go, the longer we live and more we see, we know that this is more of a challenge because all of a sudden your kid's exposed to internet. I wasn't exposed to internet at age 13. I didn't have a cell phone until I was 19. No, actually, I think it was 20. My first cell phone I got it was on 4th of July uh, after I got engaged. So yeah, it was 20. I dated my wife and didn't have a cell phone. Can you imagine that? Some, some people don't even know what it is. There is no text messages or Viber or whatever you guys use, WhatsApp or whatever. There was no Instagram. Now it's all available. And it's extremely different, difficult to raise kids in the right way. When we talk about faith, specifically today when we're going to be talking about faith, I want you to think of the faith not as a set of values and beliefs. Like we believe in God, we believe in Trinity, we believe that Jesus died for our sins. That's, that's not the faith I'm talking about. I'm talking about practical faith would be equal to word trust. Not that you believe something, but you act out because you believe something. That you trust God. If you don't know what it is, pull out your dollar bill, it's going to say that. In God we trust. Put your name in there. In God you trust. That's the faith I want to talk about. So how do you live life so your kids would have that faith and you would have that faith and how to Set your kids on the right path with this faith because that's what they're going to need in the rest of life. I want to read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. A story of a young man who had that kind of faith. Paul's writing to him. This is the second letter to Timothy. This is the last letter that Paul wrote that we have recorded. And Timothy, by this time, he's a pastor in the church. It's not easy life. Um, society is not really going for church. There is a persecution going on. And in this era where it's not really easy to be a Christian, not really very easy to be a pastor, here's what Paul writes. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith a faith that dwelt first in your grandma, grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. So Paul writes to Timothy, says, Timothy, I know life is not easy, and I know sometimes you're even crying. Because life is not easy. Being in ministry is not easy. Being a young person is not easy. Following God is not easy path. But he says, I remember you, and here's what I want you to remind. I am sure that the faith, sincere faith that was in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, is now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. The same faith that mama had, the same faith that grandma had, now grandson has it. That's a success. Would you say? That's a successful life. Now, before you think it was easy for Timothy, I want to say that it wasn't easy. Acts chapter 16 tells us the story that Timothy lived in the pagan culture. Timothy lived in broken household. His father wasn't a Christian. Now, we see the, the believer grandma and then with mom that believed Jesus. And we see Timothy... But somehow in the way, father, Timothy's father is Greek. So mom got married to non-Christian in our terms. And they lived not in Judea, in foreign pagan country. Kind of like we are. And somehow in this family, with grandma being faithful, with mama being faithful, Timothy is faithful. 
Though father is not Christian, though pagans around, though there is no temple or synagogue, he's faithful. Now you can only imagine in this family, when father goes and worships his gods, mama goes and worship her god. You can see how Timothy was torn with all the peers pressure and everything else. And he's not really a Jew, he's half Jew, so he doesn't have to be a Jew. He's half Greek as well. But somehow, mama lived the way that Timothy got the faith from, her, from his mom. I am reminding you of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelled first in your grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice. And now, I am sure dwells in you as well. Now, who's Timothy? Paul picked him up and took him for ministry. He served in Macedonia. He was with Paul when Paul wrote Epistles to Roman. He served in Corinth. Paul sent him there. He co-authored 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. He co-authored with Paul. He was with Paul during all that time through ministry. Timothy already served with Paul, but at the end when he has trouble, Paul says, Timothy, I want you to remember the faith of your mother and faith of your grandmother. Not my faith, not the ministry, nothing else, but your mother's faith. And I'm sure that that faith is in you. I don't know why Paul referenced that, not his ministry, not his example, nothing else but faith of his mother and grandmother. I think the answer is in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in a way he should go. Even when, when he's old, he will not depart from it. See, what we plant, the seeds that we plant in our children when, when they're young will grow when they grow up. The values we send to them and give to them when they're young, that's the values they will keep all their life. Paul talks about this faith as a sincere faith. Very interesting word to describe faith. For me, it means that mom and grandma, they were Christians not only on Sundays. Not only when they went to church. Not when other Christians were around so they would look Christian for them. That means that they were Christian 24-7. They lived as though God was there with them. See, our problem of today's generation is that we think that spiritual maturity equals spiritual knowledge. The more I know about God, the more spiritual mature I am. Wrong. That's not how it works. The more I trust God, the more spiritually mature I am. That's how it works. When you not know about God, but trust God. When you have not knowledge about God, but fear of God. That's when spiritual, spiritual maturity uh, is exposed. And, and with this sincere faith that Paul is talking about, his mother and, and grandmother. He probably knew grandmother as well and mother. He met them. He says, this is sincere faith. This is not something fake they were trying to present to look Christian before Paul. So Paul would take Timothy with them. He saw their faith as real thing, something that they can lean on, something that was real and concrete they can grab a hold of and hold on to. Do you have that kind of faith? Is your Sunday is different from Monday through Friday? Do you have that kind of faith when nobody's watching? When you're at work with people who don't believe God? Do you say something to your kids that they shouldn't do that, but though if your kids would knew that you're doing the same thing at work, but they don't know. That's the good thing, right? Is your faith real? Is it sincere? See, for, for them, faith was more than a tradition. For, for a lot of people, Christians especially, faith is more of a tradition right now. The things they do. They get together, sing some spiritual songs, they listen to a sermon, they sleep through a, a pastor's preaching like I did last Sunday. Sorry, it was silly. Yeah, I had to confess. I, I have a video of me snoring in the back row. Um, it was a very rough, rough night last Sunday, and I, I just slept right through the, everything he said, so I'm sorry. Uh, happens like that, right? So 
our tradition, we just do things. We go to church, we celebrate certain holidays, we have Easter and Christmas that we do, and it's a tradition. You know, we have a Thanksgiving as a tradition. It started out as a Christian thing, now it's just a tradition. For them, faith was a lot more than just a tradition. You know why? Timothy wasn't circumcised. Now, by law, he was supposed to be. By, but, but for them, faith was more than just keeping the law. They can discern and determine which is right, which is not. And, and though he wasn't following every tradition of the law, he had faith. Amazing. So for mom, it was more than just keeping all the traditions and laws of, of Judaism. It was a sincere, real faith that was way above every tradition that they had. See, we can teach our kids all the traditions, rights and wrongs of Christian life, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to teach them to trust God. Because when we're not around, God is always there. When we don't look at them or can't see what they're doing, God is there. And our job is to somehow transform this faith. For them, faith was more than just words that they speak. I've noticed in my life, there are things that I've said to my kids that I need to repent before I would say to them. You know, you teach them some values and deep inside, you know, you're not really doing, <laughs> that's the right thing to do and the right thing to say, but really, you're not doing it. Some of your kids are here, so I don't know if I should ask you to raise your hands right now. But anybody else with me there? I guess I'm the only one. All right. It's confession time. Everybody else, I know your kids are here, so my son is here as well. We're, we're cool. I'm not afraid. I'm a fallen human being. But sometimes you tell something to your kids, and you know that your heart is not really 100% there as well. Anybody told your kids to read the Bible the morning you haven't read the Bible? You know what I'm saying? You tell the kids to pray when you forgot to pray? You tell the kids that lying is bad when you lie? You tell the kids that cheating is bad and then you do something that is not really cheating because you don't consider cheating, but if you step back and look at somebody else's life, you say, oh, that's wrong. It shouldn't be done that way. You know what I'm saying? See, their faith was sincere. It wasn't just the words that they speak to their kid. It was actions, their lifestyle that Timothy saw and copied. Because kids will never do what we tell them to do. They will repeat what we do. You can tell them wherever. They're just going to repeat what you have done with the greater, bigger scale. They will Magnify your values. Expose your nature. That's what kids will do. You can say the right things, but they know because you cannot hide from your children. They are so interesting that they can see your motives without even speaking to you, but they know what's going on in your head and why you're doing it. You know what I'm talking about if you have kids. Their faith was more than just words. Their faith was a lifestyle. A lifestyle of perpetual trust in God. As we said, the setting wasn't easy. It's not Judea they lived in. Pagans all around and father is not Christian. But their lifestyle was a perpetual trust in God in everything. And Timothy caught that. He caught not the words they were saying, but the values of their heart that they lived with. He caught that. And that's one of the principles, how you transfer that faith. How does this kind of faith manifest itself? First of all, it's in our decision making. As Christians, sometimes we have to make not popular decisions in our lifestyle, in our budgets, in the um, choices we make, in places we live, they're not really a popular decision. Sometimes people say, this is crazy, you shouldn't be doing that. But as followers of God, we know that we should. 
And when our kids observe our stupid, faith-filled decisions, they trust God. Because they observe when we made the decision, and then they see the results and God's blessing. And they learn to trust God because their parents trust God. Every time you make a small decision or a big decision, live with the idea that your kids are watching this. They will copy this. And they will copy in a greater scale, an even bigger picture. It manifests also in our values. What we treasure. Are we only Christians by mouth or in lifestyle? Do our words and life align? Do our values actually God's values? Do we treasure riches of the world or lost souls? Do we treasure Christian lifestyle or we live a lifestyle that is Christian enough so that we would be comfortable inside and our conscience wouldn't really bug us anymore? Are we trying to stay as far as possible from the sin or as close as possible to the sin, but though talking to ourselves that we didn't really sin yet? When we lie, when we cheat in something, when we do something unrighteous things, do we really, what, what do we really teach our kids? That God is something separate and right now the temporary gain that we get from doing the lifestyle in the worldly way is way more important than trusting God. So when our values align, our faith manifests itself. And the third way faith like that manifests itself is our responses to hardship. When everything goes bad. Health, work, relationships, when everything goes bad. Unexpectedly. That's when our faith manifests itself. And we trust God and he, kids can see it. Not just hear about it, but see the way we trust God. When we don't lose our hope and we trust God. I'm not a great example on trusting God. In 2008, the uh, economy took a dump. Big dive. I was building a house. It was a very expensive project and uh, I realized I'm losing everything. At that time I lost the car, I lost the house that I lived in, I lost the construction, I lost business. I lost everything. I didn't have money to pay bills and uh, it really applied a lot of pressure on me. In 2008 my son was eight. And I remember one Saturday I had to go and do some things like go to the store or something, buy something. I don't remember what the story was, but I took him with me and I'm driving in, the, in my truck and he's sitting right next to me. And I'm so uh, under pressure with all my things that are going on that I don't even speak. I don't spend any time with him. I'm just there on my own trying to think everything out and figure everything out. As I'm driving, my son, he's watching this. He's observing that. He knows what's going on. He doesn't really understand what means that, that you have no money to pay bills, that your car is getting repossessed. He doesn't know what it is. Like he didn't, did, didn't have the mental capacity to understand why is it happening at eight years old. But I'm driving with him and he's right next to me. We live in Pialop and as we take it, the last turn to our neighborhood, he says, Dad, everything's going to be fine in heaven. Now I'm asking myself, when I had a downtime, my eight years old son was my support. So I'm asking myself, so what happened for these eight years of life that he is at age of eight is supporting me spiritually? At age of eight, he is my support. Not I'm his support, he is my support. He sees my problem and he comforts me with everything I had going on. I don't know why. I don't know how. But somehow he caught something in my life before. 
Somehow it happened. Especially when hardship comes. And when you have nothing, all of a sudden have nothing, and you're on your knees with your family praying. I remember when we moved to Ukraine in 2014, I might have already told this story, but um, on the second night, we, we moved in in a house, we inflated our inflatable mattresses we brought because we didn't have um, any furniture there, and um, we just slept on our inflatable camping inside the house. This speaks this way. So it was no furniture except two stools and a little table. And uh, as I slept through the second night with all the time change and everything, I couldn't sleep for about three hours. And I was laying in bed and I was crying to God and was saying, God, I will trust you. I will trust you no matter what. My, my wife thought I went crazy because I was repeating this phrase for three hours. Now, when I woke up in the morning, I've noticed that every one of my kids were crying at night. All four of them. We got together around the table that we had and we prayed together as a family. Because it was hard. I invited them into my hardship, into this path of trusting God, and we got out of it. But the kids, they, they see when you struggling with something. Bring them in. Share with them. Teach them to go to struggles trusting God. Don't try to protect them. You know why? Because similar things will happen to them. Life isn't easy. It's guaranteed to happen to them. Teach them early that struggles in life are normal and you have to walk through them trusting God. At the age of 17, I brought my son to the States. Two years ago, I made some money here and gave him $1,000. I said, okay, son, this is it. That's all I got for you. $1,000, good luck. At 17. And I left. And yes, he had hardships. Some of you think, sorry, Alex, you know, I'm talking about you. I have to preach about Jesus, but you're my greatest example. Some of you think he might be not the best kid. He's way better than I was in 19. Because when you teach your kids to go through hardships with you, when you teach your kids the values are important, when you teach your kids how to make decisions trusting God, they will copy that. They will copy that. So how do you learn to live that life and how to demonstrate such a faith. First of all, do your inventory. Ask God, honestly ask God that he would look in your heart and say, point you to the places where you don't trust God. That you're doing things with your own personal ideas and your pers personal worldview, where you don't trust the word of God, but you do your, your own thing. Ask him to point this in your life that you would confess that and maybe even confess in front of your kids for not giving them an example. Second thing you need to do, ask your kids where you were a good example of faith and ask them where you were a bad example of faith. Don't argue. Don't argue. If they say something, don't argue about it. Don't try to correct them. Don't try to explain to them. Accept it. Pray about it. Confess. If they haven't seen you as an example of faith, you need to confess before them and say, this is wrong. I agree. I'm weak. Pray for me. I need to change this in my life. And I need to trust God with this in my life. And I want you to trust God. But we have to go through this together and learn together because I'm not perfect. I'm just a human being. Ask your kids where in what area of your life you didn't show them your faith. Where they cannot copy. Where they looked at it and said, this is bad. I don't know my parents are doing that. I see. But they couldn't tell you because you're always right. They can't come up to you and say, you know, daddy, Christians shouldn't do that. They know it. They talk, you know, to each other about it, but they can tell you, so go ask them. Ask them. 
And don't argue, don't try to correct them, don't try to make you look better. Just ask, accept, and go pray. Talk to your wife and pray about it and confess. And the third thing you need to do is to live your life with understanding that your kids are watching you. When they're not around, they're watching you. Because you are who you are. At work, at home, in church, they see everything. They know everything. They hear stories when you talk to your wife about your work problems. They hear stories in the car when you discuss family matters. They hear stories about church when you drive home. They know what's going on in your heart. They're close enough to you to know who you are, what you trust, how do you act. They know it all. Live with conscious understanding that they will copy that. They will copy not just a little bit of it, but everything in the greater scale. Because what you sow in their hearts will grow in their hearts. Always will grow in their hearts. If you want your kids to have straight, strong faith, it's rather simple. Learn to have strong faith. Trust God no matter what. And your kids will repeat that again. I know it from my life. I know it from the lives of many other people. For me, for me personally, my personal goal is when my kids look at Hebrews 11, they see my name in there. You know what I'm talking about. The heroes of faith of the past, that they would see me as a hero of faith of today. Someone they knew personally. Not just father, but the hero of faith who acted and trusted God. That's my goal. Am I perfect? By any means not. Am I trying? Yes. And I'm inviting you, inviting you too. Because that's the best thing you can pass along to your child. That they would have faith that you had and your parents had. Because that's what they need to succeed in this world. Amen.